my name is Mohammed, and I'm a graduate student in aerospace engineering in Sharif University of Technology in Tehran. And what I wanted to present to you now is how design and structure matrix can save lives. Uh, well, uh, I'm sure that you have all seen fire up close, but these fires are not the one that you want to see up close. These are wildfires. And uh, what is very unfortunate is that we are fighting against these wildfires with very, very old tactics. I mean, old like in World War II. And uh, what is being done in this research is uh, using uh, modern techniques like dependency structure matrix to try to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of a process architecture used to fight against wildfires. I will talk about the results and a quick summary. Well, uh, in comparison to 1970s, wildfires now burn twice the area of United States forests, up to 10 million acres, which is around 40,000 square kilometers. And also, the uh, costs of uh, fire suppression has uh, skyrocketed from 400 50 million dollars before 2000 to 1.65 billion dollars afterwards and so uh, to make the situation even worse more and more people are moving towards suburban areas and this means that more lives and properties are at stake in case of fire wildfire and global warming and cyclic droughts also mean that we are going to see more of these wildfire incidents to happen in the future and on the other hand, fighting against wildfires was not a very benign and straightforward operation. And 1,099 firefighters have lost their lives in the mission since 1955. So here are the uh, four major resources to fight against wildfires, air tankers, heli tankers, ground crew, and smoke jumpers. Well, uh, once initiated, the perimeter of a wildfire starts to grow nonlinearly fast with respect to time. And there is a point after which the resources, the, the rate of growth of fire perimeter is greater than the resources, but the potential to suppress or even contain it. So it is very important to, to act fast. And so uh, air tankers are used in the earliest stages of the mission when a fast and decisive attack is needed most. And it might be interesting to note that more than 97% of all burned area in three decades was caused by only 1% of fire incidents, which are the fires that their perimeters have, have uh, escaped out of control. So this means uh, that time is mission critical. However, Aerial firefighting has had its own challenges. Well, during 1955 to 1999, 250 airborne personnel have, have uh, passed away in air crashes. And to the contrary of what one might expect, the uh, modern technology, technology of the 21st century didn't do much to reduce the fatality rate. And 82 more pilots have died ever since. And a rather unpalatable uh, claim uh, by accident investigators is that in almost 75% of the accidents, human error was the primary cause. Well, it's easy to point all fingers to the poor pilot, but the real challenge is to reduce the chances of human error through engineering and design. And another piece of puzzle here is the high stress levels experienced by air tanker pilots and which will uh, have undoubtedly contributed to the uh, high human error rate. In 1998, 108 of 135 interviewed experts uh, expressed that the problem of aerial firefighting lies somewhere within the uh, process architecture or what they call operation model and that the operational model requires amendments, but nothing has been done. In 2008, the National Interagency Aviation Committee, NIAC, reckoned that the current process architecture have been developed decades ago and based on the technology available at that time. And it called for a change in the operation model using modern technology. So this is actually what is being done in this research. 
So uh, in other words, we are proposing that let's use DSM to help us to gain a systems view over the process architecture to help us to answer these questions. What are the complexities of the process architecture that lead to the high human error rate that leads to accident? And what modern technologies can be used to reduce the chance of human error? And how then to effectively integrate those technologies into the process architecture? Well, comprehensive uh, data regarding the operation, the concept of operation of aerial firefighting has been studied. Uh, hundreds of pages of uh, case reports and uh, official data to uh, develop the process architecture uh, in DSM representation. Uh, well, this is a schematic of the organizational architecture of firefighting. The incident commander is at the highest level of authority, but he is located in a ground station far from the incident. And there is an air tactical group supervisor, or let's call it the supervisor, who is, a, again, an expert who sits in a single-engine aircraft loitering around the fire incident, and he feedbacks information to the incident commander. And they, together, come to a mutual decision about tactics, strategies, and the drop point and pattern. And by drop, I mean the release of the fire retardant material from the air tank. And when they come to a mutual decision, they transfer the decision, the information about the drop point and pattern to a lead plane, who is again a single engine aircraft. And the lead plane flies the pattern and the air tanker follows its lead and makes a drop. And then uh, ground units are responsible for maintaining the fire line after it's initiated. Well, it seems very straightforward and simple, but the process architecture shows otherwise. Well, you probably need a telescope to see what's going on here. But as a first impression, uh, the process, it, the DSM shows that the process can be divided into four uh, phases, three of which are obviously showing some interconnections. Um, well, this is a process architecture, so feedbacks are uh, of a very great importance to us. And um, before going any further, I want to emphasize on the fact that all of these functions here uh, are taking place in a matter of minutes, so every second is important. And if there is a feedback, if there is an iteration, which is, of course, the uh, egg and chicken problem, uh, if uh, we have some of these on the, uh, above the diagonal, uh, there should be a, a very strong logic behind it. There, sh uh, there should it should have a very good reason to exist such a thing, and uh, and even if it has to exist, its dynamics should be also fast. So we can't let for slow feedbacks to be uh, to be present in a process that uh, every second is important. So uh, now I want to elaborate more about the problems that has been identified by the DSM. The first one, I call it the situational awareness problem. It stems from the fact that, well, resources, including the air tanker, await orders from the supervisor. And the supervi supervisor must confirm orders with the incident commander. And incident commander depends on the uh, supervisor for the information. And the interface between these two gentlemen, or ladies, who knows, is uh, radio talks. I mean, they talk through radio with each other and describing uh, the scenario, which is a very hostile environment, very fast dynamic. This ra long radio talks interfere with other tasks of the uh, supervisor and increases the chances of human error. The second problem is the chain of command. After the incident commander and the supervisor uh, come to a decision, the decision is uh, uh, transferred to the lead plane through radio talk, and then from lead plane again through radio talk to the air tanker pilot. This is, uh, we can't have, uh, and even if we have to have such a chain of command, it should be very fast, not through radio talk. And this is not the end of the story not even close, the most intricate phase of the, uh, of the operation is the uh, cooperative maneuver between the air tanker and the lead plane. 
And the problem here is, here is a complex, I, I call it the complex view problem, which means that the air tanker pilot must have one eye on the lead plane who is flying uh, ahead of it to, to not to miss the moment of the drop. And one eye on the environment as it is flying in a very hostile and dangerous uh, environment, too close to ground, 300 feet tops above ground level, full of smoke, full of debris. And it's an, another eye on the instruments in the cabin because it's flying very close to stall speed and very, again, close to the ground. So uh, this problem is uh, depicted by the DSM. And yeah, let me recap for a moment here. Uh, the process architecture showed us that uh, we have three major problems with the process, two of which involve the air tanker pilot and the incident commander. Well, the first one was that well, they both share the same problem that is uh, lack of a satisfactory view over the area the incident commander is out there far from the incident area and the pilot uh, ha have to uh, have a complex view problem. And the second one involving the air tanker pilot and the incident commander was the chain of command which starts from the incident commander and ends to the aircraft air tanker pilot. So the, uh, an idea was born here to why not, why not uh, tear down this uh, air tanker to pilot and the aircraft and put and, and synthesize a new module including the air tanker pilot and the incident commander. Let's co-place them, let's place them together, make a new interface. I show it here. The air tanker can be physically and functionally decomposed to two elements, the pilot and aircraft. The modern technology allows for this decomposition. And let's now put the pilot near the incident commander. And well, this co-placement have two direct results. First, uh, well, uh, it, uh, first, uh, now that the air aircraft becomes a remotely piloted air air aircraft, and so it needs a camera to be attached to it and to relay live video. And this video, uh, this physic, is accomplishing two functions. Well, first one obviously is to feed the pilot with the uh, live video to help him uh, control the aircraft. And the second is providing the incident commander with the situational awareness that he needs. So the first problem is hopefully resolved. And second, it can, the chain of command can be, can be resolved also because now that the, these two gentlemen are sitting next to each other, the, uh, there is no need for the long journey of the command from incident commander to the pilot, the incident commander can just uh, very easily put his finger on the touch screen monitor and drag it to delineate the drop pattern. And the pilot, uh, pilots are usually well, uh, uh, fairly familiar, familiar with this type of navigation. It's like uh, landing in low light conditions in the uh, airports. So uh, now with this, uh, with this re-architecturing of the organizational and uh, architecture of the system, there is no need for a lead plane to be present here because uh, the pilot doesn't need it anymore. So uh, I want to call this new thin synthesized module Remote Aerial Firefighting Station, or RAFs. And what has been done here is, could be put it another way, is that we didn't uh, introduce any new system element, but we changed the interface between the existing system elements. The first interface uh, that was changed in the system was the interface between incident commander and the pilot. They didn't have any kind of relationship in the process architecture. They were functionally separated and they were not directly connected to each other. We made a connection which s resolved the chain of command and the situational awareness. For example, you can suppose that this one here is the incident commander and this one here is the tanker pilot. They can share uh, the same view over the incident area. And another interface of the system that was changed was the interface between the pilot and the aircraft. 
Well, this will uh, resolve the complex view problem because all of the information that pilot needs to, to see can be viewed in, in one uh, monitor. All the instruments, all the, uh, see all the information about the surrounding environment and, and the information about the drop pattern can all be viewed in one monitor digitally. And the last but not least is the interface between pilot and the environment. The pilot is actually relocated from a very dangerous and hostile environment and put in the ground station near the incident commander. We, well, this will hopefully reduce the uh, stress levels feel, felt by the pilot and which will hopefully reduce the human error. And on top of that, if anything goes wrong with the uh, flight and in case that the air tanker crashes, the pilot is always safe and sound. So we will see no more pilot fatalities in the future of aerial firefighting. And as an emerging property of the uh, uh, proposed concept, the training mission will be facilitated. Now that the actual mission is unpiloted, there is no need for the training mission to be piloted. So this means more facilitated training, less dangerous, less expensive, and 24-7. So uh, I finished fast. As a summary, uh, one, uh, I can say that well, we started with some wildfire statistics, very uh, um, well, uh, uh, not beautiful statistics about the high fatality rates. And the experts uh, were able to classify the symptoms of the uh, system as outdated technology, inefficient model, and human factor. And we started with the same statistics as well as uh, more than 1,000 pages of information about the operation. And we, uh, and we were able to model those uh, information, the descrip descriptive information about the operation into a DSM model, which I helped us identify the problems. And well, well, with design thinking, we proposed the concept of rafts and which will hopefully uh, resolve the problems. And well, the verification and validation of the proposed concept is pending well, detailed design and implementation. And uh, well, as uh, any new technology introduced in, in any system uh, will uh, come, uh, comes with it technical risks. So we didn't actually uh, uh, use the, the uh, tech new modern technology in system elements. It was used in the s interfaces of the system. The uh, components like SATCOM connection for the remotely piloting and the uh, FLIR technology for enhancing the view uh, with the camera that is attached to the aircraft and the control systems used in a remotely piloted aircraft, all of these have, have been used already. But, well, uh, this doesn't mean that uh, together in this new situation they are also without any technical risks, like what, what Dr. Reppinger was talking about. So the trial of the system should be assessed, and that's for sure. For the future work, I can say that, well, after doing this research, I was very uh, inspired and motivated to use uh, dependency structure matrix in other processes that uh, we take for granted, mm, which uh, involve uh, uh, emergency situations where stakes are high and the dynamic is fast like uh, emergency landing of aircrafts, emergency evacuations, emergency hospital admissions, which is terrible where I live, and try to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of these processes using dependency structure matrix. Uh, thank you very much, I'm open to questions.